All right. Let's start with Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831. It says the Indians are acknowledged to have an unquestionable and heretofore unquestioned right to the lands they occupy until that right shall be extinguished by a voluntary session of our government. He goes on to say that Indian tribes are in a state of pupillage. Their relations to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. This is a really big concept, the concept of ward. What does it mean? I mean, where did they come up with that? It's kind of, uh, it's one of those questions that uh, just, it's, you have to just address it by talking about it. In dissent, Justice Johnson said, they have in Europe sovereign and demi-sovereign states, and states of doubtful sovereignty. But this state, if it is the state, is still a grade below them all, for not, our, for not to be able to alienate without permission of the remainder man or lord places them in a feudal dependence. This is where the, the history of Oklahoma tribes becomes very interesting. Uh, we start hearing things like feudal. What, is, what does that mean? Feudalism. Where does that, that come from? Where did they, where did they come up? Well, it has something to do with that's known as a lodial right to title, which means the monarch owns everything. Uh, if the land is a lodial title, then it's free. It's not holden to any, any lord or superior it's owned without obligation of vassalage or fealty. It's the opposite of feudalism. Justice Baldwin, in the same case, will, will dissent. And he'll say, in the spirit of maxim, uh, in the spirit of the maxim opsta principis, which is, let's nip it in the bud. He's very pro state, very anti tribe. He says, Indians have a right of occupancy to their lands, as sacred as fee simple. Absolute title to the whites, but they are only rights of occupancy. They are incapable of alienation. He goes on to state that this court decided that the Indian occupancy was not absolutely repugnant to a saison in fee in Georgia. So these sound like what, they, what, what, what could be considered as very legalistic terms, but uh, there's a reason why I'm wearing uh, Darth Vader today. Is because when you start discussing tribes and relationships to the United States, uh, you start entering into a concept that was introduced by Europe, and that is feudalism. And that concept is, is all around us, because where does the term ward come from? What is saison and fee? What is feudal dependence? Where, where are all these concepts coming from? Because they are not listed out inside the treaties that the tribes sign. So if you go to the Law Dictionary on the link inside, uh, uh, inside the text, you'll notice that seiza means the completion of the feudal investiture by which the tenant was admitted into the feud and performed the rights of homage and fealty. Uh, if you've ever seen, I'll, I'll throw in a clip of, of Monty Python, uh, basically it's Knights of the Round Table. And they are only allowed to govern what the king allows them to govern. And so when you start dealing with the, the uh, War, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia or Wooster versus Georgia, you're going to start seeing some ideas that, uh, that seem like they're out of left, left field in dealing with tribes. Definitely the tribes didn't have this point of view of it. So if you continued on, you get this picture. Justice Marshall pictures uh, the United States as enveloping the tribes and in some ways protecting them. A ward. A ward is someone like uh, someone that is mentally incompetent, someone that cannot handle their own affairs. And so what he's saying is, is that by treaties, executive treaties, and by legislative approval of those treaties and laws governing uh, uh, exchange with tribes, and then the judicial department, the judiciary, uh, upholding the Constitution's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Constitution's uh, Supremacy Clause, which says that treaties shall be the supreme law of the land, that all of these things protect tribes and is intended that the tribes would still remain and have their property. However, the dissenting voices uh, inside this case, especially those representing the state, 
say that it's the United States, then the state, Georgia, then its citizens, and then tribes and slaves underneath that. So we have two different points of views, and, and it all comes from this concept inside of feudalism as to where in the strata or where in the um, uh, caste system tribes fit. In Wooster versus Georgia, which is later decided, uh, Justice Marshall goes on and he says, These articles are associated with, uh, with others recognizing their title of self-government. The very fact of repeated treaties with them recognizes it. And the settled doctrine of the law of nations is that a weaker power does not surrender its independence, its right to self-government, by associating with a stronger and taking protection. In other words, he starts citing Vattel's uh, statement that tribes are in fact a tributary or feudal state. In fact, if you go and read Vattel, which there's a link to it, and you go to section 7, uh, he goes on to expand, expound on what a tributary state is. Uh, it says the custom of paying tribute was formerly very common. The weaker by that means purchasing of their more powerful neighbor an exemption from oppression or at that price securing his protection without ceasing to be sovereigns. In other words, tribes as the weaker unit sought out the protection of the United States and by placing themselves under the protection of the United States have accepted uh, a tributary or a feudal state of relations. He goes on to say in section, in section 8, the Germanic nations introduced another custom that of requiring homage from a state either vanquished or too weak to make resistance. Sometimes even a prince has given sovereignties in fee and sovereigns have voluntarily rendered themselves feudatories to others. So what Vitella is saying is, is that the weaker unit, our tribes, essentially signed a treaty and therefore we became kind of uh, we became a weaker state underneath uh, under underneath a more sovereign state as a matter of fact if you look at the 1790 treaty that the Creeks signed it, it talks about the undersigned kings chiefs and warriors as parts of the Creek nation it says and it goes on to say in article 2 to be under the protection of the United States of America and of no other sovereign whosoever. What is interesting about this is uh, if you read it, especially as it really relates to uh, Tulsa public schools, is it's signed by Little Talisi and Big Talisi, or in other words, the original Tulsa towns that were uh, uh, among Creek. Also signed by the Tukabachi, uh, some of the Nachi, uh, the, I'm looking here right now, uh, the Alabama, the Cushadas, and the Broken Arrows and the Coitas were signatories on that document. So this concept of placing the tribe under the protection of a sovereign or of an empire goes back to how Europeans decided Native American history was going to be played out. So as we move on, uh, you can kind of think of it this way, which is kind of really, it's, it, it's kind of seriously demented in some ways. Uh, they were essentially, by creating a fief or a piece of property, which is, uh, fief is a piece of property, by making us a, a feudal, feudal, feudal state underneath their empires, they were in fact requiring us to pay homage. And in so doing so, it's kind of like a sharecropper system. Uh, the tribes don't own the property, but we get to live on it and enjoy the benefits of it as long as we pay X amount of dollars or provide X amount of trade and, uh, and obedience to the, to the masters, so to speak. This is interesting because tribes initially did not see the machines, I'm sure. Uh, Machiavelli, in The Art of War during the Renaissance, said, a captain ought to, among all other actions of his, endeavor with every art to divide the forces of the enemy, either by making him suspicious of his men in whom he trusted, or by giving him cause that he has to separate his forces, and because of this, become weaker. What is really interesting is, as you watch the, the interplay, as we go through this, in this Native American history, as we go through the cycles 
what you're going to see is, is an effort uh, by either France, Spain, or England to cause tribes to have conflict with each other. And because of that, they are able to essentially establish a trade, establish a uh, feudal position over those specific tribes. And uh, it plays out really dramatically in Spanish feudalism. For instance, Spain, after they conquer, and specifically, specifically when they go through and they conquer the Aztec, then the Maya, then the Inca, and then DeSoto comes in among America, uh, uh, the, the southeastern uh, United States, among the southeastern mound building tribes. Coronado goes among the Pueblo tribes and, uh, and making contact eventually with the Wichita uh, tribe in Oklahoma as well as the Apache. Uh, you start seeing this and what Spain is allowed to do in 1503 is they are allowed to uh, become, in effect, feudal lords. And, and they bring Spanish feudalism. And it's a fancy word they call encomienda. And in encomienda, that means they basically make the Indians the tenants of the land who belong, and, and so as tenants, uh, as vassals, they belong to whoever conquered them or whoever's given the title to the property. Uh, that also was part of the 1513 of the requirimiento. Essentially, it's slavery. It's, it, it's, you're born into it. Uh, it's a caste, uh, caste system that you're never able to escape, so it, it's slavery. Long story short, and by the time you get to France and England, uh, by the time we get to the Americas, their treatment of the feudal tribes, those tribes that they consider their, feudal, their feudatories, uh, if you will, uh, France and England had, like, prior to discovery, had spent like a hundred years fighting. It's called the Hundred Years' War. Uh, probably the most famous French that came out of it, Fran uh, French person came out of it, was Joan of Arc. She got a vision from God. Uh, and so they kicked out England one, at one time. As you look at this map, one of the things you're going to notice is that France, its French citizens and its Indian allies, it tried to keep those in, in complete alignment. Whereas in England, there was actually a separation between the colonists and the Indian alliances. This will get spelled out because it's this kind of backdrop that will create, uh, will create the feudalism that uh, the tribes will experience underneath the United States. So by the time you come to George Washington, you're going to notice if you, if you click on that one link uh, later on when we get to the Revolutionary War, you're going to notice he's wearing a gorget. Well, gorgets are holdovers from, and as you go and you explore that, you're going to see that it's a holdover from the neck piece uh, that was worn in by knights in their uh, in, in their full armor. Okay. Well, since the invention of the gun, uh, those specific body armor became uh, impractical, and so as a result, the holdover for uh, the officers within England and France and Spain was the gorgeous. And so they wore that, and so you knew who the officer was and the one that was in charge. You're going to start seeing that they give uh, those, those gorgeous to tribal leaders, like uh, Cherokee chiefs. Osceola, there's a famous painting with Osceola. He has three on. Obviously, he was given those by Spain. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Red Jacket has a large medal of peace. Uh, uh, he's a Seneca chief. So when we talk about this, it's kind of like feudalism and the knighthood came to America. And so to understand how the European powers dealt with our people and dealt with Native Americans is you, you have to first experience that idea of an empire. Darth Vader, if you will. Uh, just using him as an example because there were three empires and uh, those three empires were playing chess with each other constantly. Spain versus Britain, Britain versus France. Uh, they were always mustering for who was going to control the gold in the new world and as a result of that, that feudal structure from each one of those, those countries will shape Native American history.